Fire control computers solve fire control problems. Their solutions depend upon own ship's course and speed, target's range, target's bearing, target's course and speed, wind speed and direction, initial shell velocity, and other factors up to a possible total of 25. The factors occur simultaneously and many are constantly changing. But the computer continuously and instantly solves the problem and sends the answer to the guns as train and elevation orders. A computer cannot do this without men. For example, men operate the director, which sends target range and bearing to the computer. And here at the computer, other men set in other information. Obviously, computer accuracy depends on the quality of the information it receives. And that depends on the skill and understanding of the men. If you look inside a computer, you find an impressive assembly of basic mechanisms. Some of them are duplicated many times in one computer. A first step toward understanding a computer is understanding these mechanisms. This film, part one, describes four of them. Shafts are commonly used to carry values throughout a computer. One revolution of a shaft is assigned a numerical value. If rotation in one direction is designated as positive, then opposite rotation is negative. The nature of shaft values can be demonstrated with a rack and pinion. In this case, the rack is calibrated so that one revolution in this direction represents plus 10. Continuing with a half revolution, shaft value now is plus 15. Another half revolution making a total of two revolutions from the zero position, and shaft value is plus 20. Now add minus two by one-fifth turn in the opposite direction. The result, of course, is 18. Similarly, two complete revolutions in the minus direction subtract 20. And in this case, the result is minus two. The rack and pinion were used here to demonstrate the nature of shaft values. In practice, racks and pinions may be used to translate shaft values to corresponding linear movement. Or the rack may transmit values to the shaft. Gears are usually used to transfer values from one shaft to another. With a gear ratio of one to one, the numerical value remains unchanged, but rotation is reversed. With gears of different sizes, shaft values may be multiplied or divided by a constant. With this gear ratio of two to one, one revolution of the driving shaft causes two revolutions of the driven shaft. Cams may be used as computing mechanisms. Ordinarily, we think of a cam as a mechanism that changes a simple motion, such as rotation, to an irregular or intermittent motion.
all cams have a working surface and a follower the working surface may be an outside edge like this or it may be the walls of a groove the follower may be a roller a ball a pin or some other device that slides or rolls on the working surface different working surfaces are designed to do different jobs. To show in a general way how working surfaces are designed, suppose we take as an example the problem of changing rotary motion to corresponding linear motion. Let's say that one shaft rotation is assigned a value of 10. For a shaft value of 1, suppose we want the follower to move this distance. Then for a shaft value of 2, the follower must move twice as far, three times for three, and so on. The purpose is to establish the shape of the working surface for this particular problem. The principle becomes clear when we add a representation of a follower and a scale. Four on the shaft, four on the follower. The same with all other values, not only for whole numbers, but for all values in between. With an outside shape as the working surface, the capacity of such a cam is limited to one revolution. Additional revolutions can be obtained by extending the working surface, which now must be a groove. An example is the constant lead cam, where the follower is a pin riding in the groove. In a fire control computer, a rotary input of ship's speed is delivered as linear movement of the follower. In the reciprocal cam, the output is equal to 1 divided by the input. The working surface is constructed by plotting points on radii. This distance on line 1 represents 1. Half this distance on line 2 represents the reciprocal of 2, or 1 half, 1 third on 3, and so on. With this curve cut as a groove in a disk cam and a follower added, the cam output will be the reciprocal of any input. Let's watch it. Disk cams generally have a non-computing runout at both ends of the plotted curve. This is a square cam, so-called because it delivers the square of an input, which may be either plus or minus. The tangent cam is an example of a trigonometric cam. In this cam, the input can be any angle between 40 and 70 degrees. The output, the tangent of the angle. This time of flight cam is an example of a flat ballistic cam. The working surface is the outside contour of this part. The input is range. The output, time of flight. This is a sector type follower held in contact with the cam by a spring. You can see how the cam turns the output gear.
A barrel cam, also called a three-dimensional cam, computes from two different inputs and delivers one output. The barrel shape is the working surface. This is the follower. The example shown here computes super elevation. Briefly, the problem is this. Gun elevation is the sum of super elevation and advance elevation of the target. Super elevation increases as advance range increases, but not in direct proportion. Super elevation decreases as advance elevation increases, again, not in direct proportion. Thus, super elevation is determined by advance range and advance elevation, both of which are the inputs to this cam. The output is super elevation. The mechanism can be understood if you first consider the super elevation problem at one elevation only. There can be any number of ranges, and each range requires a different super elevation. In a cam cut for one elevation only, an input would position the cam for advanced range and the working surface would produce the corresponding super elevation output. But this cam is for one elevation only. To handle all elevations, the barrel contains an infinite number of such cams. A cross section at any point is a cam for a particular advance elevation. The required section is selected by the elevation input. The range input positions the barrel for the required range. The principle of the barrel cam is as simple as this, although in application it may appear quite complex. Differentials are used in computers to obtain continuously the algebraic sum of two quantities. These quantities represent the inputs. As the inputs vary, the differential simultaneously delivers the answer, no matter how rapidly the inputs change. This is a bevel gear differential. There are other types, but we are using this as an example because of its frequent use in fire control computers. To understand how it works, it's necessary to know something about its construction. Remove the gears and you see two shafts. They are solidly joined together. The shafts and these gears form an assembly called the spider. These are the spider gears. This is the spider shaft. And these are end gears. None of these four gears is fixed to its shaft. Each gear is freely mounted on bearings as shown in this cutaway. Connections to other mechanisms are made through spur gears. One lock to each end gear and one lock to the spider shaft. Additional gears and shafts complete the connections. Although there are two spider gears, only one is needed for the mathematical problem. The other is there to balance the mechanism. So we can remove one spider gear, and we now have the basic elements of a differential. To study its operation, it is necessary to count and compare revolutions of the end gears and the spider shaft. That isn't easy to do. We'll show the differential action in a way that's easier to follow. Essentially, this differential is a gear between two gears. 
Now imagine that you cut the end gears and make them flat. You now have a pinion between two racks. The operating principle is the same as the bevel gear type. Either rack, A or B, or the pinion may be used as the output. The other two parts then are inputs. We'll use the pinion for output, the racks for inputs. Now let's examine the mechanical action. Motion will be plus or minus, measured with reference to the zero point. Move A four inches in a plus direction, and B two inches. The sum is six inches. Note that the pinion center has moved three inches, or half the sum of the rack displacements. When A is at one, and B at three, the sum is four inches, and the pinion center is at two inches. As another example, move A to minus four inches, and B to plus two. The algebraic sum of the rack displacements is minus two inches and the pinion center has moved to minus one. Measured from zero, the change in the position of pinion center is always half the algebraic sum of the rack displacements. Because of this relation between rack and pinion movements, a differential can be used as a computing mechanism. Instead of inches, we assign a desired scale of values to the racks. Then, with half that scale for the pinion, the pinion indicates the algebraic sum of the rack values. Three plus one on the racks, four on the pinion. Plus one and minus two, minus one on the pinion. Plus three and minus three, zero on the pinion. There is no fundamental difference between the rack and pinion differential and the bevel gear type. The racks which are limited in length are replaced by end gears which serve as endless racks and handle values in the same manner as do shafts. The pinion is replaced by the spider gear. Movement of the spider gear center along its circular path is delivered as rotation of the spider shaft. Adding the second spider gear to balance the mechanism, we now have the complete differential. It should be remembered that the output may be either one of the end gears or the spider shaft. The other two then become the inputs.